In this episode of our best of season, we're heading out for an adventure. I'm Kat Neville, and this is Feast TV. Since Feast TV debuted in 2013, we've had a lot of adventures. And so I went back into the archives and pulled out some of my favorite episodes that really kind of took us far afield. And throughout this episode, I'm going to be showing you how to make a very easy, very quick smoked trout pasta. But first, let's head out to the woods for a morel hunt with the Missouri Mycological Society. The weatherman says, over an inch of rain. You can't find morels unless you endure the pain. <laughs> Official rules for morel madness. Rule number one, all participants must smile and act like they're having a good time, no matter how many mushrooms they have found. My name is Willie May, and we are doing our 25th annual Morel Madness for the Missouri Mycological Society. The Missouri Mycological Society started about 1990, and then we expanded to other cities and other chapters. So we now have a Columbia chapter, we have a Springfield chapter, we have a Kansas City chapter, the season starts usually around April 1st, and in, in, uh, we're talking about St. Louis County. It lasts for about three weeks. They're elusive. Sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. Flowers, birds, trees are gorgeous, and I love to identify them, and I love to find them, but there's something about mushrooms. It's the hunt. The hunt is what is so much fun. A lot of people hunt and they just go and they look at the ground. That's looking for morels, but if you want to hunt for morels, you really have to look at the trees. So we're here in Quiver River State Park and all the groups have broken up into different levels of difficulty. Easy, medium, and hard. We're part of the easy group because we have all the camera equipment and now we're actually entering the forest and starting to hunt for those mushrooms. Let's go. First tip, know your trees. Morel mushrooms have what's called a mycorrhizal relationship. They're dependent upon the root system, the certain species of trees, in order to put up a fruit body and reproduce. One of those trees would be an ash tree. You can just tell by the, the pattern of the bark, primarily. So this is another prime species of tree uh, that morels form that relationship with. So your elms, your ashes, and then your eastern white sycamore. It's got the, the uh, flaking white bark. Uh, they grow in river bottoms primarily. I trim them down and saute them in butter and they flake apart. They taste exactly like crab meat. This is a very, very young chicken of the woods uh, to reproduce. It's forced to come from pores. You can hardly see them here because it's so young. This, on the other hand, the spores come out of these little tooth-like structures, uh, which is different from like a normal mushroom that has gills. So there's some different examples of how uh, mushrooms do their thing. The morel 
season lasts two, three, maybe four weeks. The rest of the year, the organism itself is just, is a, a mycelial, what they call it, a mycelial mass underground. So that's why you find it coming up in the same spots every year. That's correct. So you find that uh, that good tree. That uh, yeah. Your secret tree. There you go. The, your <laughs> magic tree is the is the actual term uh, in in circles. So. Love it. But maybe we'll find a magic tree today. There we go. <laughs> many morels. In fact, Chris, the guy behind the camera, found this teeny tiny one that's kind of dried up on the side of the road, but it was still a successful hunt. We found a number of wild edibles and had a great time walking through the woods. Now we're going to head back and have some lunch. And just when we thought all hope was lost, we got back to the parking lot and Charlotte pulled out of her basket a big, beautiful morel. So we're back at the lodge and everybody's gathering and making lunch and here's a selection of the wild edibles that people found on their forays. Everything from wild garlic and wild onion, chicken to the woods, some more of that spider wart and this wild sorrel that tastes like green apples. Everything is just so gorgeous. It's a little taste of Missouri. So we didn't find a lot of morels on that hunt, but we did have a lot of fun. And obviously we found some other wild mushrooms while we were in the woods. It's a wonderful pastime to forage for wild ingredients. And if you're able to hook up with an organization like the Missouri Mycological Society, they will teach you the ropes. So I'm just kind of doing my mise en place. I'm getting everything ready to move over to the stove because this really is a very quick and simple pasta. And if you're looking for the recipe, have no fear. You will find this recipe along with all of the others from this season and all of our past seasons at feastmagazine.com. So this is just some cherry tomatoes. Then I'm just gonna dice up my onion. I am dicing up both the leaves and the stems on my parsley. There is tons of flavor in the stem. Okay, we're going to head over to the stove and get the pasta started. My pasta water is boiling and you want your pasta water to be as salty as the sea because it is seasoning your pasta as it's cooking. So I'm just going to throw in my fettuccine I'm gonna cook the pasta until it is al dente, and while I do that, let's head out to Wing Shoot Farms for a duck hunt. Ducks fascinate me. I don't know why, but they do. They're, they're gorgeous, they're interesting. As soon as you think you got them figured out, they teach you that you don't, and uh, what's that? And they're delicious. <laughs> we started Wing Shoot Farms in 1999. A bunch of the guys had been members of a duck club farther south in St. Charles County. Uh, the owner passed away. We needed a place to hunt, so we came up and bought some land here. And I've uh, been kind of building and expanding on it ever since then. Now, I think this duck club is an incredibly social experience. Some of my very best friends are members here with me. I hunt with them every day and uh, have been bringing my kids out here since we've had the place. So they all spend a real important part of their youth here. And whenever they come back into town, they seem to make their way up here for at least uh, one hunt or two. For me, it's a friendship. It's the guys that we hunt with all year and the kids and the camaraderie. And then secondly, it'd be nature. It's great to be out here and, and being in the middle of nature. Yeah, it'll keep you warm. Yeah, thank you. Now I look like Rambo. <laughs> I feel like a swamp girl. I feel very official. It's a good day for us. We'll see what happens. It's hunting. <laughs> Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't.
So Steve and I are standing in a blind, and this blind is how many feet, do you think? Uh, probably four feet in the ground. And it's just a, a metal box that's lined with, um, with wood. And as you can see, we're surrounded by all the dried stalks of corn. And so I think we're pretty well camouflaged yeah. to entice some ducks to come our way. Today's what we call a ducky day. Mm -hmm. So that there's wind, there's cloud cover, it's a little chilly. The more you don't want to be golfing, the more you want to be duck hunting and vice versa. <laughs> so if it's a gorgeous day, you don't want to be here. If it's crummy, crummy day, you're like, oh, do I want to go outside? You want to be in a duck hunt. That's great. So you leave the corn on the stalks right. as a way to attract the ducks? You can grow other crops. The corn's the best. It withstands the weather better. A lot of guys have uh, beans, and ducks will eat beans, or they'll eat millet or milo or whatever, but once you get a hard freeze or hard frost, that tends to fall over. The corn's sturdy, and the ducks love it in that regard. It's the ideal crop for us. So they'll go sit on the river, they'll sit on the conservation areas, and then, but then they want to feed at night, and so there's no food on the river, obviously, so they'll come in here. Any species that's allowed to be hunted in Missouri is heavily controlled and regulated by the state and federal government to make sure that the population sustains itself where it is or gets stronger. And you do that by limiting the season, limiting the hours that you can hunt, limiting the number of birds you can hunt on any given day. Right now we've got more ducks alive in North America than we ever have. So it's been a tremendous success story for the overall population of ducks. Rules in Missouri are 60-day season. Generally starts about Halloween, usually ends about Christmas, plus or minus a week. You can shoot six birds a day. There are various species limits, so you need to know what you're shooting at before you do it, and that is the way that we keep the species going so that next year the hunting is as good as it was this year or better. He's using different intonations. One's a, hey, get back here call. Yeah. One's a, everything's fine, come on down call. It's just different sound. I got a real good handle on where the ducks are just by listening because I've been hunting with them for 15 years. And... So how close do they have to be for you to be able to shoot them? About 25 yards, 30 yards, maybe 40. So you see the edge of the water there? Mm -hmm. If a bird's flying, you wouldn't want to shoot them too much farther past. Oh, okay, That's so they have to be pretty good. close. Yeah, yeah. There you go. I never miss. <laughs> Conservation is about money. Within five miles of here, we have both a state and a federal uh, game preserve, which is where the animals can thrive and prosper. That doesn't come about without money. And hunters pay for the privilege of hunting in Missouri. You gotta play by the rules and you gotta pay for the privilege. And that's been going on for about 80 years now. The amount of money the Department of Conservation has collected through hunting licenses is substantial, and that's what funds the conservation effort. In addition to the public efforts, there's a great deal of private effort. The most notable on a national basis is Ducks Unlimited. We've also got the Great Rivers Habitat right here in the bottoms land here of St. Charles and uh, Lincoln County, all of them working very hard to keep the species alive, healthy, thriving, and uh, getting stronger every year. So it's a public-private effort that's probably as good as an example as you're going to see in terms of cooperation and ultimate success.
So you have nine members of the Duck Club? Right, there are nine of us here. And uh, it's an excuse to get together. The season's 60 days long. And Steve and Bobby are out here. You know, they're, they're helping the farmer plant the crop, get the soil ready, get the blinds dressed out and everything. And so, you know, for some people, it's it's a two-month-a-year experience, and for others, it's kind of a 12-month-a-year deal. That was nice calling, boys. That was a tough one. I was I was up over the corn and. You're a good shot. Is there as much fat on a wild duck as a duck that you would buy in a grocery store? I would think not. No, those ducks are. I, I don't even know if they're outside. You know, they're indoors yeah. or whatever. They're penned up or pretty close to. You know, whereas these things are flying. I mean, bird you shoot here is a real good chance. Yeah, he's probably flown a thousand miles to get here. So I mean, it's lean. Great, thank you. Thank you. And I was really intrigued by what it means to hunt. You are able to spend time in the natural environment, which I think a lot of folks don't have a chance yeah, to do I mean, these days. You get a tremendous respect for the animals, you get a tremendous respect for outdoors. All of my buddies are heavily involved in the conservation efforts, either d doing something or contributing, you know, good chunks of money to it. And the duck population is stronger now than it's ever been in terms of just numbers. A lot of people who don't hunt would be surprised to hear that. Yeah. If you don't protect the resources, they won't be here right. to enjoy. Right. People like us buy licenses. We support conservation. As a result, it's it's been very successful. Experience Missouri outdoors, whether it's with a camera, whether it's with binoculars, or whether it's as a hunting experience. Just get outside and appreciate all of the wildlife and all that nature has around us. It's all right there if you wish to take advantage of it and go out and, and, and immerse yourself in it. So after we went on that duck hunt, the guys gave me a few of the breasts. And if you go back into the Feast archives to see the cooking demo from that episode, there's a recipe using the wild duck breast where I make this berry sauce. It's really, really tasty. So I have just some olive oil and butter in my saute pan. I'm gonna heat these guys up and then I'm gonna add in my onion and get that nice and soft. I'm gonna deglaze with some dry white wine. And then I'm gonna put in my tomatoes. I'm gonna let my tomatoes cook down just a tiny bit. While I do that, head with me to Rockbridge Rainbow Trout Ranch and try to say that three times fast. It's the reason why I'm making this smoked trout recipe and that's where we're going. at the Rock Bridge Rainbow Trout Ranch, and today I am learning how to fly fish, but first I have put on these waders. Rockbridge is located in southeast Missouri. We are 85 miles southeast of Springfield. My grandparents moved here in 1945, uh, started the resort in 1954 and we've been raising trout and lodging and a restaurant ever since. We raise between 250 to 400,000 fish a year. We raise them predominantly to put in the stream at two pounds for families to come and stay and catch their fish. We also supply certain restaurants. We smoke our trout and we are licensed to ship it around the world. Oh man, I was 
probably eight or nine, you know, and just going out to the, the creeks or the lake with the family. And you grew up in this area? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And that's what kind of keeps you here is just the love of nature? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's nice and quiet. The fish that you're raising, that you're breeding, do you use that to stock kind of yes. the fishing areas for yes. your guests? Uh -huh. From egg to a, a nice pound and three quarters to two pound fish, it takes about a year and a half to two years time. And that's what I love about where we are right now is that we aren't just at a hotel along a river. I mean, you really are a trout ranch. I oh, mean, yes, you're raising yes. the fish and you are helping to facilitate people coming here for a fishing weekend, like a vacation. And is it true that when you catch the fish, you'll kind of help everybody clean them and then you stick them in the freezer until people are ready to go? Stick them in the freezer. Uh, we, we package them up and then until people are ready to go home. So this is essentially my first time fly fishing. I'm glad that you have taught many novices before. You have to take it easy on me. Uh, this is our fly line. So the fly line and the rod, that's what's going to help us cast. And I got you a nice purple one. This is called a prince nymph. So a nymph, I'm assuming, a baby fly, a tiny fly. Mm -hmm. And so it's meant to mimic. Just that. mimic some of the bugs in the water that the trout are, are feeding on. I'm going to show you how to do a roll cast. OK. I'm just going to bring the rod straight up about 12, 1 o'clock. And then all we're doing is just using mostly wrist. And we're just going to lay that right out there. Pull it up slow, let the line settle, and take the rod tip all the way down to the water. Oh, I see. And that's how you kind of get it further and further out. Kind of just getting that timing down. There you go. Good job. Nice. I think it's time to go fishing. So how many people are you teaching in a season? I would say I teach anywhere from 150 to 200 people a year. Oh, wow. Oh, there you go. Oh, look at him. Strong. <laughs> Pretty good sized fish. I mean, look at the tension that he's got on that. This rock. is a nice size one. This is a big male. So you don't like yank it and then just fight with it? No. On a fly rod, it's all about taking your time and wearing the fish out. Oh. Look at that fish. That's a big one. It's huge. I really didn't realize how elegant fly fishing is and how much patience it really does require, not just in casting the line properly, but the way that once you actually kind of hook the fish, you just have to very patiently and gently guide them toward you. It's an art. Yeah, and a sport. That was fun. I think we're going to meet up with Wanda next, and she's going to teach us how to cook these things. So I'm standing here with Wanda. Wanda, you've been in the kitchen here, you said? About 20. 20 years. 20 years. 20 years. And so you've been cooking trout for a long time. Yes. But you're going to show us how to cook a whole trout, which I really love this kind of a presentation because it's kind of dramatic, mm -hmm. you know, when you have the whole fish coming to the table, but yeah. it's deceptively easy to cook this way. It looks yes. very complicated. Yes. It's very easy. All right, so show me what you're gonna do. You're gonna spray your pan really well. Mm -hmm. Put your fish over here. Okay. We're gonna take the salt and sprinkle some in your cavity. Mm -hmm. We're gonna do the butter and then lemon juice. And then I like to just Push it all around in there a little bit. Make sure it's coated the meat good. And then you're going to take some of your stuffing and you're going to stuff your cavity. And you want it to be nice and thick. Oh, so you do want it to be thick? Oh, yeah. You want it like this. Oh, wow. You want it to be like a pregnant fish. <laughs> all right, so now we've got the lemon. Uh-huh. Lemon, lime, and basil. So you're going to really put this on thick. There you go. Perfect. Just like that. All right. And then they go in the oven for 45 minutes. What temp for the oven? 
About 350. So just mid range. Mm -hmm. Mid range. This is what it looks like when it's done. That's gorgeous. I mean, look at how the skin is all crispy and all of that wonderful stuffing has kind of steamed the fish from the inside. I think we should dig in. It's just sweet and tender, and it has just a wonderful, mild flavor and just flaky. That's delicious. It's very good. The trout is raised here. It's, you bring people here to learn how to fish, to have fishing weekends. And then in the restaurant, you really specialize in serving. It's kind of like this 360 experience of trout in Missouri. Yeah, that's cool. We do a lot of trout. <laughs> yes, you do. We do some other stuff too, but we do a lot of trout. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate You're it. You're welcome. What I love is that someone like me, who really doesn't have any experience at all fly fishing, I'm able to go down and have a tiny experience of what it's like to be a real fly fisher, men or women, and then be able to eat that wonderful, freshly caught trout. It's a really unique and special experience. So my tomatoes are nice and soft. Now I'm adding in about a cup of heavy cream. We're nice and thick. I'm gonna add in a tiny, tiny touch of cayenne, and then a few shavings of fresh nutmeg. In goes the trout. I'm putting it in pretty whole because it's a very, very delicate fish, and it's going to break up as we toss the pasta around. Last addition, that chopped fresh parsley. I'm gonna take this over to the cutting board. I'm gonna serve it up. This is delicious. The cream sauce is a perfect carrier for the smoky richness of that trout and having the acidity from the reduced wine and the tomatoes, all of that mingled together is a very luxurious and also simple dish, so best of both worlds. Thank you very much for joining me for our best of adventure episode. I will see you next time.